So good morning from my side, everybody. Uh, I'll start a little bit with the instructions to all the attendees and our panelists. First of all, we have uh, uh, the role of our presentation. And when they're all done, uh, our moderator, Tobia, uh, will open the floor for a few questions. You can write your questions in the chat box. And then moderator speakers will take the floor or write the answers uh, directly in the chat box, depending on the flow of questions and number, but also the flow of the discussion later on during panel discussion. I would like to remind everybody that the activity is recorded as we're going to publish it on all our external media, for example, YouTube. And at the end, uh, I will be posting on the chat an evaluation form. You have already received an email with all the details uh, and including their evaluation form, but we will also uh, share a follow-up email with the presentations of our panelists and again, the evaluation form. We will ask you to take a few minutes to share your feedback. And with this, uh, what I would like to do is pass the floor to Tobias for a few welcoming words to pass the floor to our uh, today's panelists. Thank you very much. So we over it. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tobias Weckling. And I'm responsible for knowledge exchange and tech transfer at the University of Vienna and co-coordinating the UNICA working group, UNICA and the city. And I welcome you today to our the first webinar in our new series, Reaching Out Universities and Society Challenges in the City. So why did we do this? Why we organized this webinar series? So um, first and foremost, we believe that universities not only could and should pay uh, play a greater and more active role in coping with society challenges. Uh, this no role needs to go, as today's presentations will show, beyond the contribution of researchers uh, who certainly contribute to the solution of society challenges in many ways through their research. Instead, it also should include active agencies of universities as institutions, as well as students, researchers, and also administrative staff. This applies probably especially to the focus of today's webinar, which is engaging with and supporting migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. There are, of course, already many initiatives out there to address uh, these and other challenges, and you are probably here because you are either involved or know about some of these challenges. And we are often driven by highly engaged individuals within uh, higher education institutions. In practice, however, these initiatives often face many internal as well as external problems. In today's webinar, therefore, we not only want to talk about best practices and projects that try to support migrants and refugees in different ways. Instead, we also want to discuss questions like what made these projects successful or unsuccessful and what made their implementation difficult or challenging. In order to address these and other questions, we have invited today four speakers, not only from different countries, but also different academic disciplines and career positions from full professors to students, because we believe that coping with uh, society challenges such as the current refugee crisis is important for everyone. We will start therefore with some opening remarks from Juan Rayon Gonzalez. Juan is currently the president of the Erasmus Student Network. Uh, and in his talk, Juan will talk about Erasmus Student Network's vision on the connection between the internationalization of higher education and the society role of universities through the example of social Erasmus. Before we start, some last housekeeping remarks. Um, we will allow two to three very short questions after each presentation, uh, and, but we will have some more time in the end of the webinar with a general discussion and the Q&A session. And as already explained by Pete, you can ask questions in the chat and I will do my best to keep track. But last but not least, I would like to thank once more uh, for, to all speakers for being here today and especially the UNICA team and namely Laura and Pete for their professional support in organizing this webinar. As always, we wouldn't have done it without you. So Juan, the floor is yours and thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Tobias, and thank you to, to the whole UNICA team for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today talking about one of our favorite topics in the Erasmus Student Network. I'm gonna share my screen, have a, a presentation. 
So I'm going to be talking today, as, as Tobias very well said, about the vision of the Erasmus Student Network about this very important topic, which is how through higher education and in our case, more specifically uh, from the internationalization of higher education dimension, we can contribute to tackle societal challenges and how we can make higher education a force for good in our communities. Um, for those who don't know my organization, well, as Tobias said, I am the president of the Erasmus Student Network, which is the key international student and alumni organization working towards the enrichment of society through international student mobility, active in 41 countries with four, four, 500 and around 20 um, local student organizations. And of course, in the vast majority of UNICA members, we have fantastic ESN sections working very closely with universities. We have more than 15,000 volunteers, highly committed to organizing activities for more than 350,000 students and many more local students and communities. Our activity is divided in three pillars, which already starts to connect a bit with the topic of today. Student support and engagement, and especially the engagement part is highly relevant here. So making sure that international students are supported during their stays abroad, but also that they are engaged. They're engaged with the communities that host them. Outreach and promotion, so also making sure that internationalization becomes broader and broader and reaches out to more people, and also reintegration, making sure that the students, after going abroad, after engaging in internationalization, they can continue to be active in the, in the field and they can continue to engage with relevant topics for society. You all know the definition of internationalism of higher education that has a very important component to understand why it is so connected with the topic of today, with the idea of tackling societal challenge through higher education. And, and the idea is that internationalization is not only a goal in itself, it's actually a means to an end, which is basically to improve the quality of education. And then even more importantly, probably because it's highly connected, to make a meaningful contribution to society. And for us, this means that if we focus on creating a meaningful contribution to society, we're also helping to improve the quality of education in general. And this is expressed in our mission statement, the enrichment of society through international student mobility. So basically for us, what this statement means, it's a, a reflective question, right? A, a rhetorical question we could say, how do we make sure that communities also benefit from international student activities like international student mobility, and that then the impact goes beyond those participants that take part in these activities? And our idea is that international activities, as we will see now through initiatives like Social Erasmus, can be planned in a way in which they benefit society as a whole. So whenever we plan the, our initiatives, we consider the needs of the community and not only the group of students that are participating. And for us, this has been a priority for almost two decades now. ESN exists since the beginning of the Erasmus program, since in, um, 1918, 89. Uh, but mostly after the first decade of Erasmus, we started to realize that even though student mobility was becoming a very relevant force in, in the higher education landscape, and there was a lot of societal support for it, there was an elephant in the room that to this day we continue to try to tackle, which is that internationalization and student mobility are not always resulting on more interaction between students and local communities. And then we thought, how can, can we tackle this problem in a way in which we ensure positive benefits for communities and not only for the, the very reduced group of students that take part in mobility. We also saw that this was against the expectations of students, that the students wanted to make more local friends than they actually did, and also that local, for, local students and local communities wanted to interact more with international students, and that students kept on reporting this as, as barriers that they faced during their mobilities. And also what we saw is that even though the late motif of student mobility is highly connected with a positive change in society, and we're trying to build, you know, like multinational communities that spam across borders, the engagement part was not really happening in the mobility experience of the hundreds of thousands of students who go abroad. And we saw this in our data quite clearly when asking students, even until very recently, we keep on seeing that the vast majority of them do not really engage with the communities that host them. And this was a call to action, has been a call to action for us for, for quite a long time now. And, and we have made a lot of progress to our initiatives. We also saw the positive part, why this is one of the reasons why we believe that this internationalization dimension is very important in the topic of social responsibility of universities, we could call it, which is that through international initiatives like student mobility, we know that students become more aware 
of pressing societal challenges. We know that just by going abroad, even if the experience is still not planned in a way in which it results in more impact, students do become closer to key societal topics such as environment and climate change, as you can see here, or human rights. So the potential is there to really make sure that we use that vibrant and diverse student community that we all have in our universities nowadays through this international student population to make an impact on society. And also, very importantly, that when students go abroad, they truly become these global citizens that we like to talk about. They, they truly develop multi-layered identities in which without losing any sense of belonging, with their local communities or with the universities, they become you know, more aware of their global and European identities. So we can use student mobility to bring these topics closer to them and also to activate them in a way in which they actually contribute through initiatives to these communities, both when they are abroad and later at home. So then the idea is that interaction with local communities and this responsibility also of the students, not only of the institutions, should be at the heart also of the international experience in all kinds of international activities. And also what we saw in terms of the institutional framework is that even if nowadays higher education institutions recognize the importance of engagement through initiatives like the one that Unica is leading here, this is not always translated into systemic changes in the structure of student mobility, and I would say the higher education experience in general. And of course, the recognition of this engagement and increasing should be at the core of the planning to ensure that the students who are not so motivated to take part become agents of change. And this is how our vision, you know, like behind the, or the idea of community engaged learning becomes so important. When we see that an educational framework is needed to support this community engaged learning. So it cannot just happen as random activities, a bit isolated activities that higher education institutions do. It needs to happen through established educational frameworks that really allow students to make a difference and also get their learning outcomes recognized and become more aware of what they have learned throughout the process. And of course, that in that process of involvement, student organizations, NGOs, researchers need to be involved so there can also be a continuity to the engagement. Um, our initiative, Social Erasmus, is based on the idea of community service learning, in which there is a meaningful service to the community, and this service is also recognized and is part of established learning paths. And this is how we have tried to develop our Social Erasmus initiative. And basically, um, the initiative is, is, is quite straightforward. It's about volunteering on exchange. It's about mobility experiences that have at the core the interaction with local communities. This is something that ESN has been doing now for more than a decade as a program, but that some years ago, we were able to fully establish and give a, a proper policy framework to the Social Erasmus Plus project in which we focus on the integration of exchange students in local society, and also the implementation of better quality volunteer activities with collaboration between universities, student organizations, and other actors such as local schools and working on those educational frameworks that support the participation of the students. And besides the policy work, what we have been trying to do is large scale implementation phases. So what we try to do is to use the umbrella of ESN, which is also something that it's important in the context of, of UNICA or other university networks. What is the role of networks for common initiatives in the field of engagement, how you can mobilize more people to implement a lot of activities and to move it from a project context more to an institutional setting for organization to, to make it a, a core part of our work. Here you can see some of the results of the first campaign that we did within the Social Erasmus Plus uh, project framework, which we managed to reach uh, more than you know, 100, almost 100,000 people, almost 20,000 students reaching out to hundreds of schools, especially schools in, in, in neighborhoods with low socioeconomic backgrounds. And then the important thing is that we use that project to create this program, let's say that this is what we have now established framework, which is our, our activity management system in which we are able to support the organization of local activities uh, that foster interaction between international students and local communities and also to measure the social impact and to explain our local volunteers and the students what are they learning throughout the process and what is the impact that they are achieving. And you can see the results nowadays. This is also open source accessible information in our webpage. 
To this day, thanks to Social Erasmus, since 2019, we have organized 14,000 activities that have engaged almost like more than 700,000 participants and also in more than 1,400 cities. So all kinds of cities with different characteristics, uh, different types of communities reach. What is the key of this process and what are the takeaways that I would like you to, you know, to take from, from this session? It's this structure for organization of activities that involve students and local communities in the internationalization um, field. The student is always at the center and there are three actors that always involve the work with the student and not only for the student. The university, student organizations that have a leading role in the planning of the activities and in implementation, and then local community actors, in your case, mostly schools, NGOs, but also it could be others. So this is, let's say, our, our pyramid for the organization of impactful activities. And we focus mainly on three things, meaningful, meaningful benefit for local communities, co-creation with the students and local actors, and institutional support. These three elements are what make our activities so impactful, because if we think about the meaningful benefit for local communities, rather than, you know, like the, the wish of the day, we know that the students also learn more and that we have a bigger impact, but also the institutional support makes activities relevant and manages to convince students to participate that otherwise might not do it. Just to give you an example, of how these kind of initiatives can be implemented from an institutional perspective. We have the initiative from Besançon and the University of French Comtem, in which for years there has been a specific course on French language learning, intercultural awareness, and social inclusion based on local volunteering of international students with local students, with 25 hours of volunteering, three, four activities a week, in which there is a work that involves the student organization with the support of the university, with preparation of the sessions, intake and debrief meetings, and also continuous evaluation of the, of the learning. This is done through an elective course that is awarded with three ECTS, so that recognition is really important, and it involves cooperation between different actors. And then just to finalize final parts, why are international student networks such as ESM, but not only, so important for the creation of these initiatives that have large scale impact? First, because they give students a space for mutual learning. And this is also very relevant for you now in the context of the European University Alliances, but also UNICA, how there is learning also beyond the activity, thanks to the, the pure learning between students. Initiatives can be tested at the local level and then scaled up. This is something that we do a lot, thanks to our network. We try something in a particular context, and then we try to make it a network-wide initiative. And also having a common direction, a common strategy allows for coordinated impact. So what are the key points uh, that I believe are important uh, you know, to conceptualize this, this kind of student-led um, societal initiatives that can help local communities? First, prioritize needs and benefits for the community and adapt pressing global issues to the local context. This is something really important. Think about the connection with, with research, especially uh, like citizen research initiatives that can start as volunteering projects and then lead to different kinds of initiatives in that regard. And then involve students in the, in the driving seat, let them have that leading role with you supporting them. Involve community actors in the design and implementation, and then also put recognition of the learning experience at the center to reach beyond usual suspects. And of course, uh, promote the importance of these networks of students that can help them to, to scale up their impact. That was it. I hope I didn't take too much time. And I would like to, to thank Unica for this really important conversation. And I hope that also these kind of practices that we try to do at the, at the Russian Student Network can help you to design new initiatives. And of course, we look forward to work with you, to working with you and your universities in the implementation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Juan. Uh, perfect timing. And uh... There's no questions so far. I'm sure there'll be questions later. So I have just one short question to clarify. So Social Erasmus was based on an Erasmus Plus project, if I understood correctly, right? And your numbers are very impressive numbers. have been from 2018, 19, but the, the project or the service is still ongoing, right? It's still there. Erasmus Plus so has yeah. been, it's now an implemented uh, long-standing service. Yeah. And, okay. So this is a very good question. Thank you very much. I will explain you because it's a very interesting process. So like, uh, as I was saying before, Social Erasmus is the perfect example of a grassroots initiative that starts 
with local ESN associations in Poland, and then becomes a network-wide initiative that then leads to not one, but actually two Erasmus Plus projects. We did a first project almost one decade ago in which we explored a bit the concept. And then we did another one, which was Social Erasmus Plus, in which there was more institutionalization of the practices and a bigger policy framework, leading, for instance, to changes in the Erasmus Charter of Higher Education. The project finished, but then the initiative and even the materials created the state. So this is how we try to work, right? Of course, as you know, for NGOs it, well, and for universities, it's always challenging you know, to get the proper funding to, to do the community management, to do the, the proper impact as, assessment. But what we have kept is the platform and all the building blocks of the initiative that ES and local associations continue to implement. And now we have a new project called EGEM that also builds on the results of Social Erasmus Plus, once again, trying to work more with educational frameworks that can be implemented in the context of European university alliances, et cetera. But I think the main takeaway also related to your question is that thanks to this network effect, we can take local initiatives that we screen with our network mechanisms, scale them up, and then let's say empower those activities on the ground, right? So it's a full circle process that really helps to, to increase the impact of our activities and, and also the, you know, the, the policy relevance because from activities, we can do also advocacy at the European level, asking the European Commission, for instance, to prioritize more engagement in the framework of the Erasmus Plus pro the F program, et cetera. So this is a bit how, how the process works. Okay, thanks. So I think the, we will come back to this kind of question, how we can go beyond uh, single projects and implement these services within university structures. So thanks again, Juan. So following Juan's presentation, we will proceed with our three case studies. Uh, first, uh, Mara Mata will speak about higher education institutions and their employees as agents of change. The presentation builds upon the results of the in here project, which focuses on supporting EU higher education efforts to welcome refugees and student staff. Uh, Mara is Associate Professor of South Asian Studies at the University of Rome La Spienza, Sapienza, where she's also President of a Bachelor Degree in Global Humanities. Furthermore, she is the Sapienza Coordinator of a Global History Lab Program led by Princeton University in collaboration with the Central European University, formerly Budapest, now based in Vienna. As a researcher, uh, Marta has decades of experience with research in China, Tibet, Nepal, Bangladesh, and India, specifically working on cultural and cinematic productions involving people stranded along and across borders in South Asia. So Mara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for having me here with you again. It's a pleasure. Thanks to Pete and Laura for all the work they put into organizing this, this panel. I will share my presentation. I hope you can see it. Um, just one second, because I see my face next to so yes, uh, my presentation today is about a project that was carried out by Sapienza University in collaboration with partners like UNIMED, the European University Association, uh, Universidad de Barcelona, and uh, Campus France, and uh, IOM, the Organization for Migration, um, and uh, in the frame of an Erasmus Plus program. Uh, so it was co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And um, despite the fact that the project has now come to an end, I think even most because uh, it's come to an end uh, and we would like to give it follow-ups and capitalize on it. So we are actually working. continues working together with uh, the international area with another project called Unicore for uh, corridors, university corridors for refugees. Um, we would know what uh, we learned, most, mostly what we learned, not as much what we have done, uh, which I will uh, uh, talk very briefly in a while, but what we have learned. And uh, in order to do so, I would like to start from, um, uh, if you allow me to read from 
or a writer and a, a, a political thinker that he wrote in the 1960s a very beautiful book um, that in one way was, you know, the challenge, growing up absurd problems of the youth in an organized society. Now, I think whatever we are doing here today is putting up with what Paul Goodman was trying to conceptualize in the 1960s in a different uh, climate. He was talking about the American Corporative uh, Academy, but I, I think it regards all of us today's, maybe today more than ever, especially following what uh, uh, looking at what Anna Arendt had written in the 1940s and uh, um, retrieving the essay We Refugees by Anna Arendt where she actually postulated that uh, refugees were the vanguard of the others to come. And Agamben um, says, regarding to the paper by refugees as the vanguard of the others to come, or all of us, uh, that in the context, I quote, of the inexorable decline of the nation state and the general corrosion of traditional legal political categories, only imagine of the people in our at least until the process of the dissolution of the nation state and sovereignty has come Mara, to an end the refugee I'm, is this so yes Mara, i'm sorry to jump in we are having some issues yes it's better if you close your camera to have a better connection as you speak and show your presentation because we're having some delays with the sound you can share your screen but just close your camera okay. so the connection is a bit better Apologies okay. Again. Okay. I, I will. I will do that. Okay. I will do that. Thank you. Thank. Thank you. Sorry. Is it better now? It is. I, I, we will see. But I think it, it will be better. Okay. Okay. So I was. I was quoting from Agamben. Uh, at the importance of looking at the category of refugee in the way Anna Arendt has done in the 40s and using the refugee category uh, as, a, a, you know, um, an instance of the vanguard to come. And I wanted to connect what Agamben was saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, when he, in the 90s, he looks back at the reason why he thinks what Arendt has put forward as a, an important statement by Arendt, the refugees were in fact the vanguard and that they were the only imaginable figure of the people in our day. I wanted to put this in conversation with what Paul Goodman wrote in the 60s, Growing Up Absurd, when he's actually problematizing why youths feel disenfranchised in systems and in organized societies like our own. And uh, um, quoting from Goodman, he says, we live increasingly in a system in which little direct attention is paid to the object, the function, the program, the task, the need. But immense attention is paid to the role, the procedure, the prestige, and the profit. We don't get the shelter and the education because not enough mind is paid to those things. Naturally, the system is inefficient. The overhead is high. The task is rarely done with love, style, and excitement. For such beauty, beauties emerge only from absorption in real objects. So I think this sentence from Goodman and the underline of the fact that the system can be changed. Art where we work, where we are engaged, and we, as the title of the presentation, say we are socially responsible for allowing more inclusive societies in the era of migration. I think when he said, uh, stated, like the importance of uh, um, uh, co creating together uh, when it is important to actually engage uh, more in society, in the societies we happen to work and uh, um, look together at the issues at stake in order to produce what he was saying was important to achieve a coordinated impact and institutional support. So the project that we tried to 
uh, Bring Forward was a project that was interweaving these issues that I was trying to present from Arendt, Agamben, and Goodman all together as like, if you want, um, the three uh, magis, like the three uh, columns and pillars of what I think is the ethical stance that, uh, uh, and the aesthetic in a way, um, stance that we take inside a project that regards refugees and migrants uh, and uh, construct uh, inside the university in order to achieve unidiversity, uh, not just on paper, but uh, as a good practice. And there was, first and foremost, I have to thank all my colleagues, some of them are connected here to get today, um, for, you know, uh, all the work they have done. And uh, I have uh, spoken to you um, briefly during our email exchange about my concern regarding the invisibilized nature of uh, uh, active uh, uh, administrative participation in what we try to do. And uh, I think this is an ethical stance. There are many people who are working towards creating catalog of good practices, as we have done, creating webinar series like you are doing today, um, creating other guidelines for administration staff and producing recommendations so that we can build on um, good practices, strengthen knowledge sharing, um, facilitate uh, the access in higher institution across uh, to meaning by global in an interdependent and interconnected way as the Erasmus always tries to do what I want to delve more in depth, um, more visible and better resource initiative, and give sustainability of successful project within the EU policy framework. Sustainability, so that's why I was saying this project may have come to its end, but it, it is not finished. It is just the beginning, because what we were trying to do is to create pilot projects, it was to, to reinforce synergies between in between very successful initiatives that we knew of and um, bring forward and encourage further collaboration uh, in order to devise uh, stronger common policies. So the definition of national and international and global in the sense of interconnected long-term strategies for the development of institutionalized and sustainable initiative and more coordinated actions was at the core of what in here project tried to do. And um, this was, was uh, the core because at aim of it was really to create a network of support for refugees. And I want to remember what Arendt writes in 1943. She writes, we don't like to be called refugees. I think this is an important statement. We don't like to be called refugees. But nowadays, when Agamben retrieves her essay written in 1943, he says, probably now, you know, like, we don't even think if people like or do not like to be called refugees. It's taken as like somehow for granted that people become refugees and we have inflows of asylum seekers and refugees and we try to devise strategies to cope with it, strategies to make them part of our society. There is one part of the original essay by Arendt where she says, we of course are demanded to forget and we are also demanded to be optimistic. And I, ironically she says, and I am of course very optimistic. Now, I think her irony that verges on sarcasm is something that should make us think about uh, what we do when we are devising this project, because somehow she is pinning you down to the ethics of it. I will become a refugee because I cannot help it. But when you are, you know, kind of like strategizing for support or for integration, please do not ask me to forget. And that's why I liked very much what Juan said. We ask 
to co-create something today. We ask more participatory approaches. We um, are really kind of suspicious of the system trying to integrate in a top-down approach without involving the stakeholder, the primary stakeholder, who is the ref what who we call the refugee. So unidiversity was done keeping in mind the ethics and the aesthetics of institutional strategic planning. So trying in a Paul Goodman way, he was an anarchist and it's anarchists are very popular nowadays in Italy, I was, you know, trying to promote uh, more creative strategies. How do we come out of our comfort zone? How we make sure, and I am happy, that's why I keep referring to my colleagues, where the pillars, they are the pillars behind the success and the sustainable approach to addressing these challenges. And so the, the output that we had as an analytical address, a systematic analysis and mapping, and uh, um, the, the, the possibility, you know, of kind of putting down, writing down the contribution in order to share it and uh, achieve more equity, diversity, and inclusion, it is important in connection to the output too, the awareness campaign. And the awareness campaign is an awareness that has to transform our campus in something that I always like to think unpacking um, campus in camp plus us. There is no campus without us coming together. Without the us, the campus become a camp, the modern matrix of the modern world in Agamben world. So it is not a liberating place. It could be like a systemic, uh, even abusive place if we don't become aware of what we need to do in order to be really inclusive and uh, capable of accommodating diversity in an inclusive environment. So I don't want to steal too much time. Uh, one output of the documentary was um, a documentary and uh, I have shared uh, the trailer with uh, 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 Tobias and the others in order to, to, to screen it. And we can talk more uh, during the Q&A session about why the documentary was important in order to implement output three and output four, the toolkit for the university staff and the services and the strategic framework in order to you know, create methodological instruments to support further development. Um, and strengthening of H, uh, HI strategies on inclusion. So uh, um, I would like to stop here. Thank you all for your attention and leave a few minutes for the sharing of the documentary trailer if uh, you deem it's possible and there is time. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mara. That's for, maybe we can show the trailer in the end of our uh, of our webinar. Um, so I hope, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I very much like your presentation and also historical reference to Hannah Arendt reminding us at one point or another in our lives, everyone can be a revenue chief. Uh, so people have a short memory. But the, the audio connection was a bit bad. So maybe I've missed it. But just to, I have a question because there is nothing in the chat as far as I can say. So you did have a co-creation approach. So you involved, let's say, refugees, migrants in the development of your toolkits, et cetera, right? Yes, we tried to involve refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, international students at large. Uh, but especially, I would say, in the documentary, there was an effort and being... Um, in one way to not have a prescripted approach, but to co-create the scenes and go physically also go in those places where people wanted to go and talk about the places that they recognize inside the university or outside the university as uh, crucial spaces, either because they were obstacles or because they were places where they 
uh, somehow went beyond the obstacle. So that was like a very co-creative moment to understand even invisible boundaries that me maybe we took for granted, you know? So it was very important to see what they identified as this was a moment for me, this was a space for me where I felt safe or I felt supported. And this was another space where instead I felt even mocked in my right to have rights, just to keep uh, quoting Arendt in this space. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure there will be some more questions later on. Um, so now we move on to our second presentation uh, in which Joe Carthy is addressing the crucial questions of are universities doing enough to respond to certain society challenges? Joe is professor, um, just a second, no, you already shared your screen. Joe is professor at the School of Computer Science at the University College Dublin and founding director of the UCD Center for Cybersecurity and Cybercrime Investigation. Joe is also, however, director of the initiative UCD in the community, which aims to support and promote civic engagement across the UCD community and beyond. Today, Joe will share his experiences, also suggests some actions on how universities, as relatively well-funded and well-resourced organizations, which they are, besides all the complaining all of us do all the time about funding, can do more to cope uh, with current and future societal crises. So thank you for being here, Joe, and um, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Tobias, uh, and thank you to two previous speakers, Juan and Mara, they, they were wonderful and addressed the issue at, at, at the macro scale, and, and I, I feel a little bit nervous that I'm really going out to the micro scale and looking at what we as individuals in, uni in our own universities can do. I, the question is somewhat rhetorical, I think we all know that we could probably do a, a quite a bit more. Um, I, as the focus of the seminar today is on refugee and the migration challenge and every city in Europe is facing that challenge and um, not just about accommodation in Ireland we've 70,000 people have come to the country in the last year and accommodation has become a massive issue for us but there are a whole host of other issues apart from that um, and we have to respect as well that we're universities and we have other jobs to do our, our main focus is on our student education our research preserving and disseminating knowledge that that that's what we were created for but um i i i loved um juan's phrase there a meaningful contribution to society as well as something that we have to do and mara reinforced that as well so while, while they're our main jobs are education and research and so on we still have this goal and and, and need to contribute to society and as you've said tobias we're well resourced large organizations in terms and sometimes we overlook this we forget that we've all of these buildings lecture halls meeting rooms food facilities that can be used with from hundreds to thousands of staff depending on the scale of our university with tens of thousands of students again depending on the scale of our university with our online resources huge resources built over COVID, um online that can be shared with it systems and then we have our alumni networks as well our famous graduates and sometimes our wealthy graduates who we might be able to tap on to help us but we're also very bureaucratic institutions. Universities, and I know my own university, I, I, but I think I'm speaking for most of them, can be very bureaucratic. I am one of the older people I suspect on the webinar here, and I do a lot of mentoring of, of staff. And one of the things I think the staff don't realize is the amount of freedom individuals have in a university to start something themselves. It may be small, but it's something you can do yourself that you don't have to, get permission from the top. So any individual in the university, whether you're an academic or an admin staff member, you can organize a meeting, you can organize a public lecture, you can organize language classes or help students to organize language classes, you can support student activities. There are so many things that we as individuals can do. And we're all very busy. We're all so busy. And we're afraid of getting caught and trapped in commitments as well. So we have to take account of that. But I often think that rather than asking the university and saying the university should do this, the university should organize this, the university must do that. It's very easy for us in our offices or over coffee to sit back and prescribe what the university should do. But as bureauc bureaucracies, it's very hard to get them to do that. And I was a member of the senior management team in my own university, and it's very hard to get that the organization to move. So what I'm asking people to consider is what I call leadership 
with a small L, not mine, that's, I, I've stolen that idea from somebody else, but that we as individuals can lead with a small L. So instead of saying the university should do something, I can do something, I can organize a talk on how to settle into Dublin, how to find a doctor or a dentist for a, a refugee. I can get our career advisor to give a presentation on CVs. I can get one of our language teachers to tell people or show people what are the best apps to use on your phone to learn English. I can work with a student society to host conversation classes. I as an individual in my university can do any of those things. I don't need permission. I just need to get off my phone as it were and, and organize it. And, it, and these can be one soft activity. So I could do one activity in the year and there's very little commitment. So to remove that fear of the commitment, if I get sucked into this, all of my time will go and I don't have the time. But any of these activities probably take an hour or two to organize and get set up. So they're small activities that anyone can do. So in, our, in, in the university here, that's what, what has happened is the university as a whole hasn't taken an initiative, but individuals have brought refugees to the zoo, to leisure parks. They've organized conversation classes. Um, another individual organized language classes. So every day of the week, we have 500 Ukrainian um, students come in for English classes. The classes are actually given by Ukrainian refugees themselves. So effectively, it's our classrooms and our logistics that the university is providing. The teachers are there from the refugee community. Um, Mara mentioned, and I think Juan mentioned this idea, co-creation as well, that we create with the people as opposed to us being the experts bringing a solution. We need to, to work with our communities to do that. And I think that co-creation is so important. We can also help with the online resources. So an, another one of our academics gave a, a, an introduction to programming to 90 students in Myanmar. These were online resources that were available and some students then volunteered to be tutors and they met for one hour a week for 10 weeks to help 90 students in a country at the far end of the world. And it was really easy to organize that. The online resources were there, when the students are asked to put up their hands and volunteer, yes, I'll help in that tutoring, and, um, and it works. And that organization, my Mayo, are looking for other universities. The University of Hong Kong, I've been working for, with them for years, and that. So any university, any academic in any university could contact them and say, listen, I can give 10 lectures on whatever, here's things, and I can organize students. An individual can make a difference. The scale of the problem is huge. We know that. So small wins. Don't be afraid of going after small things and we can make a difference. And what matter if it's only one or two or three um, refugees or people in the community who turn up and need, that's those three individuals who we're helping. The other thing we need to spread the word to our colleagues when we do something, we need to tell others about it so we can inspire them maybe to follow our example. So don't be afraid to put a call out. Um, and as I said, once off initiatives are much easier to get started than continuous initiatives. But when people help out, they get the bug and they say, I've done that once, I'll do it again. So you can suck people in with a once off and then maybe they'll come back. So we can do that once every year. We can do that once every semester. We can do that once every month or whatever, depending on the time and availability. But it's a way of trying to capture people to get involved. This is going back to that co-creation idea. We shouldn't assume that we know what our communities need. We simply don't. We live in our ivory tower universities and we don't have that first-hand experience or whatever. So we need to discuss our ideas with organizations who are involved um, in helping or with our target audiences. We need to co-create as the other speakers have said. Um, once you've got something going then, it's easier to scale it. It's much easier to go to university management and say, we tried out conversation classes, we've ran them. Can we scale them up? We need some money. We need some resources or whatever. It's much easier to do that when you show it's working as opposed to, I have this vague idea, if you give me so much money, I can get it started. So if you start small, get something working, show it success, that's a much easier way to, to bring a university management team on board. And as kind of Tobias said, all of us, I think, in this webinar, we've won the lottery. We're, we're so lucky that we're, we're working in solid organizations with all these amenities around us, these rooms, these facilities around us. Most of us have a little bit of time. That might only be an hour a week or an hour a month, but most of us have that little bit of time. And my appeal to anyone listening is, can we consider leveraging that time by supporting colleagues or supporting students? And our student population is huge and our students are so willing to help if we give them um, a voice, if we give them opportunities to do that. It's really fulfilling work. I think we all know that. And the impact goes well beyond ourselves. So that's it in brief. I think we probably have questions at the end.
So I, I suppose I'm issuing an appeal to individuals in organizations to recognize their agency, to recognize their own power and our freedom. We all have this freedom in a university to start little things and do stuff. We don't need to ask for permission or maybe ask for permission when you're finished as opposed to beforehand. Um, forgiveness is easier than permission sometimes. So thank you very much. I've, I've ran through that very quickly, but I think um, there are other speakers to come and we, I want to leave time for questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank Back you, Joe. Time. So, um, and no questions so far. So I have a very short question to you, Joe, as a tenured professor. What, in, what we sometimes see for uh, early career researchers, PhDs, postdocs, uh, tenure track positions, there is sometimes a lack of recognition uh, of uh, activities like that, like societal activities. Do we have a scheme at your university where researchers, these activities actually get recognized by the research institutions and somehow rewarded in any way? Or is it yeah. all self-motivated, internally motivated? No, in, in our, our academic community, we have three pillars. So you, you get recognized for your research contributions, mm -hmm. your publications, and, the, and research funding. You get recognized for your teaching contributions, the number of courses you're teaching at. And then you have this contribution box as well, where you contribute to the university by maybe helping recruit students or these kind of activities where you contribute to society. And you have to tick all of the boxes. So if you don't have a contribution part on your promotion application, you won't get promoted. It's, it's probably not as, as important as the other two, but it's still treated as it's important enough that you must be doing something to get promoted. So, I, and not all universities do that. So, I, I'm lucky that I work in an organization where we actually value contribution. Now, often that contribution is taken to the university so that you participate in university events as student recruitment would be the classic one, doing school visits to try and attract students, but also um, working in disadvantaged communities. Anything like that will count as a contribution. So, it's recognized. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I think of an entire discussion about reformulation of research assessment that also might change on the European level. But uh, thanks for your insights. So, coming to our last speaker for today, which is Michelle Poya from my home institution, University of Vienna. Michelle is Associate Professor of Inclusive Education at the Center for just a second, at the Center for Teacher Education, respectively, the Department of Education. In your research, you mainly focus, among other things, on inclusive education and teacher education, diversity in schools, culture and human rights development, as well as participatory approaches to research and inclusive pedagogy. Today, she will present the case study of a project for participant-oriented development and implementation of a certification course for internationally educated teachers who had flee uh, from war and crisis in Syria, Iran, and Iraq, and other regions. In particular, and despite the success of his initiatives, which ran for four cycles and had a great employment rate of its alumni, she will highlight institutional restrictions and challenges she and her colleagues face. So we certainly will have something to talk about after Michelle's presentation. So thanks, Michelle, for being here. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm really so sorry. I just realized that I'm one day ahead, apparently, with my uh, March 29th presentation. But anyway, um, thank you so much for having me. And as Tobias already mentioned, I'll, I'll try to be really quick in explaining to you what we did, um, because actually it was quite an, quite an obvious idea, let's put it that way and um, then try to focus on, on the challenges, um, uh, especially the navigating part of different demands and, and the detours we had to take at some points. Um, so what we did is that uh, beginning of uh, 2015, as, as all of you know, um, we were part of an initiative that the University of Vienna um, actually started and then we had some smaller networks in our departments, it was especially emerging researchers who um, kind of engaged in, in doing like, let's say, work on the ground at first. And with all these refugee welcome and open border uh, movements that we saw in the beginning, we also quickly realized that we have to do something that uh, is more sustainable and actually tackles questions 
of how um, distorted biographies, especially professional biographies, can actually be um, kind of regained or how we can support people and especially uh, professionals in our areas of work and walks of life uh, to get back on their feet, uh, so to speak. So we had been uh, working on, on the issue of, of teacher shortage. We had been working on issues of discrimination and, and um, diversity in classrooms. And one of the, one of the strands in the German speaking discourse is, is oftentimes that we have a very homogeneous group of teachers. Um, and on the other hand, we, we do have, especially in German speaking countries, a lot of um, uh, children with migrant uh, background. Uh, from a lot of different countries, so especially in, in urban areas, because we are speaking about the city today, uh, there are a lot of, um, of students actually who, who come from different countries. So sometimes if we have 25 students in a classroom, we might have 20 languages or even more, but I guess most of you can relate to that issue. So what we tried was to kind of bridge this issue of, on the one hand, highly qualified teachers from uh, different countries where they, where they had to flee from, and on the other hand, the high demand for teachers because of teacher shortage on the one hand, um, but on the other hand, also this issue of um, how to actually work with students who have had the experience of war, who had been traumatized probably, who speak different languages, uh, uh, come from different backgrounds, etc. So um, yeah, it seems quite easy and obvious. So we try to piece these two uh, uh, parts of a puzzle together actually. So we created a, a certificate course where we basically try to um, um, kind of mirror what I can show you in this slide, um, going back to the other one then. Our teacher education actually consists of three main pillars, basics of education studies, subject one and subject two. And what we found is that the teachers that we could identify from the group that had arrived was that they only had one subject. And mainly they only had the subject knowledge and not really the uh, instruction part or what we might in German call the, the didactic or didactics. Um, so we saw that most of them came with one subject, for example, English or math or PE or whatever. But what they were missing was a second subject that is um, kind of the, the, the way to go in the Austrian system. And they were also lacking this, what we call the foundation or the basics of education studies. Um, as the teachers that we, whom we identified and whom we kind of developed this together with, uh, so uh, in, in our project participation was, was a huge issue because we tried to be really user oriented. We found that the easiest way ahead was actually to use this idea of the basics of education studies and try to mirror them for, uh, for this group. Um, the problem why they couldn't join university at first was that most of them were uh, dependent on social security. And as, as long as you're part of, of, of that um, financial benefits, you are not allowed to study or only allowed to study um, a small number of, of ECTS points. And we also found that for this group, so among them were teachers who had been working for 15 years, who were in the 50s sometimes, had even been head teachers before. It was not easy for them to actually think about, you know, being students again. So this idea of lifelong learning uh, at a university uh, was probably not not part of their socialization beforehand. So it, it, there was also a lot, a lot of navigating in that already. Um, we tried to be really uh, praxis oriented or we did a lot of, of internship. So um, 30 ECTS focused on the, on the theoretical parts and 10 ECTS focused on, uh, on the practical uh, part of things because we really wanted to get the teachers into partner schools as quickly as possible trying uh, also to make them aware of the differences um, and uh, try to socialize them into what we might call the, the Austrian education system. Yeah. Um, the group of interest was, was a very clear one. So um, persons who had teaching experience at the secondary school level, because this is where university is involved in, uh, in teacher training in Austria. They used, they had to have a bachelor's degree and they had to have a full official recognition, which actually excluded a, a, a big number of, of um, um, people already because they didn't have the documentation. Probably that's also an issue that we could discuss. They had to have a specific level of German already, um, which for most of them was not too much of a problem. And depending on the funding, they had to come from certain areas of, uh, of Austria. 
just talking about this really quickly, um, the most interesting part of what they, uh, what they had to bring was a proof of teaching experience. And uh, as you can imagine, when you have to flee a country, you will not ask your, uh, uh, your um, principal at a school whether they can write you a letter of recommendation. So we had to be really creative around the proof of teaching. And uh, somehow it, was, it also felt um, a bit embarrassing for many of those teachers who had, for example, been uh, head teachers for a really long time. And then they had to prove to us that their school existed. And, and this yeah, could tell a lot of stories about that. Um, yeah, moving on, uh, just the last slide about the program itself. It had eight modules. And as you could see, although this is in German, but I think it's quite obvious, we had a mo module structure. And the practical part was uh, part of the whole program. And uh, parallel to this, we were also able to offer a uh, language course. Uh, this is the number of participants. So as you can see, 23 is the magic number. Apart from the, uh, the third cycle, we always had 23 participants. The last one was the one where we finally succeeded to have more females than male teachers, uh, which was always the goal also from the funding uh, background. Um, and as you can see, most of the teachers came from Syria, but there were also countries like um, Tibet in, in Turkey in the last um, in the last cycle or uh, second, but uh, but last. Yeah, um, as Tobias already mentioned, uh, out of these uh, 94 um, alumni that we have, because one uh, one person actually stopped the program, um, uh, more than 70 actually are back in the field of education, and um, around 15 are now working as teachers. The others are mostly working in uh, afternoon facilities, like afternoon care for students. Yeah, this is already the last slide that I wanted to come to actually and where I would like to uh, focus on for the last two, three minutes. Um, navigating and balancing was a whole part of this initiative um, um, that I uh, um, kind of coordinated together with a, with a really nice team. Um, as has been discussed before, this issue of um, the worth of the impact, especially if you are, as I used to be, in the, in the face of the tenure, um, there's always this question, like, how much does it count as compared to a bigger funding? Um, the need to constantly network uh, and kind of find your identity as an academic, but also as an activist, becoming an academic activist, and really trying to cater for these different groups um, uh, and this constant work, actually, because the project has been going for with the preparation work that we did starting in 20, uh, 2016. Um, up until uh, last August, um, uh, for now uh, at least. Um, so you can see that there has been a lot of work into put into actually networking and uh, kind of also balancing the needs of the different stakeholders, may it be the funding agencies, may it be the school board, may it be the partnering schools, may it be the participants themselves. Um, also resonating with the different institutional languages. Uh, which I think is a really important part, um, understanding also the languages that we have to speak, academic output on the one hand, but then also kind of navigating bureaucracy on the other hand, um, becoming also one of the first points of information for most of the participants. Uh, so although some of them uh, have already um, kind of finished the course like three, four years ago, they still keep on calling and asking us for advice um, in terms of social security, for example. Um, expectations is also a really important part, for example, media coverage. On the one hand, it's really important to actually get into media, um, kind of offering opportunities, uh, kind of doing this, uh, this important part of also open science, but on the other hand, also secure and uh, offering a safe space to the participants. Um, which was a real challenge uh, uh, during some policy changes and, and political, uh, po political changes that we had in Austria. And I think this is also something that we don't look into uh, enough because that's also a role that many of us emerging researchers or, or now tenured researchers probably don't get enough training, um, although there are authors definitely, but I think it's also one of these parts with uh, open science that uh, need to be addressed. Also, particip part, uh, participatory elements, as most of you know, they, they take so much more time. Um, there's so much uh, more uh, issues of ethics that we actually have to address and, and might cause uh, challenges. Um, but still, they are really important in regards to projects that we develop with, with this group. Um, 
also seeing this with uh, with the arrival of Ukrainians at the moment because the needs are so much different and we're looking into supporting this group also definitely political hurdles, opportunities, and also dead ends that we have to go through. And it has to be really quick, you know, so if we if we come across a, a dead end, we have to kind of reorient it ourselves really quickly. There's not much time to reflect on things that didn't uh, work, or um, but still we need time to actually learn from failures that we did. Um, and one of the reasons why the program at the moment came to an end is actually not because we are not motivated to continue, but actually the, the group that we are dealing with um, has um, has actually been kind of diverted into other areas of work, politically speaking. And in addition, because of the caps of numbers of refugees allowed into Austria, there's currently not too much of a, of a need for this program because we simply don't have the, the, have this group in Austria, uh, which is also kind of an interesting fact, actually. The reflection on the impact that we made um, also from a decolony, uh, decolonial perspective is something that is ongoing. Also the evaluation, because some of the things that we had expected didn't happen and we are uh, now looking into why that is, but actually without funding, because mostly, as you know, there's not much funding for the, uh, the work after. And also this, uh, um, as has already been mentioned, this idea of being uh, on the one hand an academic, on the other hand being an, being an activist, which is somehow kind of a challenging situation, also considering the, uh, the needs of the institution, personal needs, etc. So yeah, um, just some of our uh, uh, outputs and uh, my contact details, if you're interested. I'm really sorry, I think I ran over the um, uh, 10 minutes, but hope it was interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Perfectly in time. Um, we have received our first questions in the chat, um, but before I move on to our discussion rounds and the first question, I just want to ask a brief question. So you have been doing your tenure and uh, tenure track position when you started with. So is there any advice would you would give your younger self or early career researcher being on a tenure track or like, you know, on an unstable job position, starting an initiative like that? So. What would you say? <laughs> Go ahead, don't do it, or whatever. Uh, well, I, I would definitely do it again, but um, I think what is really important is also, as I said, as we are kind of the first contact point for more than 90 people now, I really underestimated that, to be honest. So um, it's really challenging and time consuming. And I mean, it doesn't stop at, I mean, none of our jobs starts, uh, stops at 5 p.m. We know that. But getting calls Sunday at 8 o'clock in the morning <laughs> might not be what I expected before. But it's, it's OK. I mean, it's just one of the issues. And the other thing, really good question, by the way, I think I would demand more. Um, of this being uh, being a topic that should be of consideration in uh, in my evaluation, actually, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, um, so everyone is here, and I think we will just take up a first question, which fits very well from the chat. Um, so the question was directed to Juan. It's basically about how the civic engagement activities count during the Erasmus day. So for instance, is there, uh, can we be counted as causes that we have to attend additional causes during the Erasmus day? Uh, so Juan, I think you, you can see the question. So yeah. maybe yeah. you want to say something. Yes, thank you very much. It's actually a very important question because this is the process that we are undergoing at the moment. Until, until now, and uh, predominantly across Europe, these activities are something extra that students do. They complement the courses in most cases without having recognition, right? So the way it works is that students go on exchange and their ES and local associations, many, in many cases in collaboration with the universities, as part of the, let's say, wide range of activities that they do, they organize the civic engagement activities for and with the students. So a student maybe would take some hours in the morning to go to a school, do an Erasmus in schools activity, or good, you know, like would attend um, a beach cleaning activity, would attend these kind of initiatives without, in many cases, this educational framework that can allow for the integration of these activities in curricula or the recognition through extra ECTS. 
But what we have at the moment, it's the good practices that we're starting to see, based on some being the most established one, in which students can join this optional course and get ECTS that will appear in the diploma supplement, in which we have a perfect example of how <coughs> these activities could be integrated in a better way and recognized with proper learning outcomes, et cetera. What we have tried to do in the field, you know, from the policy perspective, is to push for the recognition of these initiatives, first of all, through specific mentions in the Erasmus Charter of Higher Education. And this is something that we achieved in the transition between programs. So now if you look at the charter, there are specific mentions to civic engagement, which has become, by the way, a priority. And not only that, in the annotated guidelines, social Erasmus is listed as a good practice. So hopefully this will create momentum slowly for universities. And of course, the challenge is to ingrain it even better. So this is planned in learning agreements. That will be the ultimate objective. And why is this important? Because at the moment, the challenge that we have is that since students need to do this as extra time, we are more likely to catch those who are already partly convinced, let's say, right? Students that are already committed, that were already volunteering back home, that really believe in those topics. We still manage, I would say, as, as a network to convince other students to take part in other activities, thanks to the peer-to-peer -peer component, encouraging students who maybe have never volunteered in their life to come to a school, present their countries, join any kind of initiatives to support migrants, etc. that we do. Uh, but we believe that this institutional framework in which engagement activities become a normal part of the Erasmus experience with inclusion in learning agreements, be it through optional courses, be it through different parts of framework, using Bologna tools for the recognition, it's, it's the way forward. And this is what we'll try to achieve in the um, now with the agent project. We believe that for that, these new BIPs, for instance, can be really powerful as a tool, these blended intensive programs, because they also have this component and you know we could explore that a bit more. Uh, but we believe that the next few years of the program will be really important to, you know, to further institutionalize this and make it a common practice in most Erasmus mobilities. Thank you, Juan. And uh, I guess it's not only an Erasmus student experience uh, issue, but uh, it applies to all students' experience. Yes. Uh, of course. Uh, again, to the audience, if you have any questions to the panelists, please go ahead and ask them in the chat. In the meantime, I think I will forward these questions uh, to, to Joe. Uh, what's your experience with involving students in these initiatives? Are they, what are the greatest challenge for the students or to get them active, uh, also in terms of their expectations, their skills, etc.? Maybe you can share some of your insights. Sure. Um, I, I think examinations <laughs> so so that you have to schedule the activity so that it's not going to clash with ex this, the preparation for the exam so you whatever you're doing needs to finish two or three weeks before the study period for the exam so it so it means it's a narrow window you need to get it started very early in the semester so the students have time and you need to be reassuring them that you'll be finished you know and have plenty of time left for, for your thing. So it, it goes back to that commitment thing that the students are happy to put up their hands and volunteer, but again, they're worried about overstretching themselves and over committing. So we have to be very realistic there that we kind of say, this is a six week activity or seven week activity, you're finished in week. So when you're finished, you have four weeks left to prepare for your exams and you can fit it in. So I, I think that would be the, my, my biggest piece of advice there. And maybe if you can limit, it's an hour a week. You know, so so they know the commitment straight up that it's not an open ended thing that you're committed. And I, I feel sorry for Michelle, um, who is getting those calls outside of hours, which most of our and I think Michelle, what I'd say to you is not to be afraid to reach out to colleagues and ask, has anyone got some time maybe to help me in this project? Because very often we start something and it, it snowballs and we take the responsibility on ourselves and then it can become very tough on ourselves. So not to be afraid, even at a late stage, to put out a call to colleagues, say, I'm involved in this, has anyone got an hour or so to help? And you might be surprised, there could be somebody who'd love to help you, but unless they're asked, they won't volunteer. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so it's not about the motivation, it's about timing and structure. Yeah. Maybe uh, giving this question back to Michelle and Mara. So we have talked a lot about, especially you, Michel, what uh, have been the challenges with, uh, with the project. So what, in your opinion, can institutions do to support these initiatives besides giving money? Maybe you can think about 
free could be uh, structures could be support structures could be i don't know teaching less teaching or to have more time whatever comes to mind maybe you could share some ideas from your experience where you could have needed some help so let's start with michelle and then move on to mara um, that's that's a really good question. I mean, I I, I would say um, that we actually kind of create these spaces for ourselves anyway. So as Joe actually said, we we kind of involve our teachers in these uh, our students in or teacher students in my case in these activities. We offer master thesis, for example, or we we offer internships, etc. So we try to combine these, and as long as that's possible, that's really good. Um, on the other hand, I think, and I hope it's okay to say that, I would actually hope that these projects would lead to more of a um, um, policy um, kind of <laughs> statements, at least. I mean, uh, seeing these programs in other countries where actually universities are being asked to keep on these initiatives, um, not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying now to um, say something about, uh, against the Austrian government, but I think it's not the only case where we see that these initiatives are, you know, not being fostered in a, in a way, you know, because I guess for our initiatives, for example, for this specific initiative now, it is something that we did because there was no alternative, right? And in other countries like Germany and, and Ireland also, as I heard, there's kind of a, of this, this idea to fuse and, and they stabilize these programs now and the government kind of taking over even. And I think this would be really nice to see the university as more of a, you know, kind of uh, initiate, initiator of, of these social, uh, social movements uh, and developments. And I mean, yeah, as I said before, I think it would be really nice to, to kind of put more um, of worth into, into these activities because I'm seeing this also with um, emerging students at the moment that they don't really see the value in doing it. I mean, they are doing it anyway, um, but academic value in, in our case, for example, where everything has to be really quick and now uh, changes in, in, in contracts, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's getting, yeah, it's getting harder actually to find people who want to engage in these activities. And I, I think that would be a perfect opportunity for universities to find new contract structures or I don't know, giving 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 an additional semester or something without having to, you know, pay fees or whatever. Thanks, Michel. Mara, you maybe want to share some ideas on how universities could support these initiatives. Okay. Yes, thank you, thank you. I uh, will following up on what Michel saying. I do agree. Uh, I would probably be less diplomatic even of what, uh, you know, I, I am quite uh, aware that Italy, I speak for it, it is in this moment, you know, uh, is, a, is, is in big trouble, I think. So we are, I'm quite worried. I speak for myself. I won't say we, but I am quite worried. Uh, I have to say that the university has been responding uh, in, in certain ways that uh, I hope uh, it will keep going, like in the sense that we have been asking for more coordination. What I felt, like also what Joe was saying, you know, um, and oh, Michelle, the calls at eight o'clock in the morning or even three o'clock in the night, you know, like all of us have experienced the fact that uh, at one point, once you commit yourself, you cannot step out of it, at least on an ethical level. You feel that, you know, you are... Um, kind of like asking people to get admitted in their lives and to trust you in, in, a, in a certain process that they, they not necessarily trust in the beginning. And um, it is a little bit kind of like uh, dance uh, on the threshold, I would say, uh, because uh, uh, it is a constant reshuffling of your balance in between what is happening outside the university, so institutions and what the, how the territory is responding, how the government is responding, for example, how, how many scholarship or uh, um, how these are allocated in order to really make these things happen, like the facilities, the logistics, 
And then there is the inside the campus activities where it's true that many people, I agree with Joe, if you ask, and you have to ask, because otherwise you may not find that that they are keen to, to, to help. They, uh, I discovered, I didn't even know there were people doing certain things, for example, medical doctors doing things that uh, it was useful for us, but because I am at the Faculty of Humanities and they are at the Faculty of Medicine, we, did really, we didn't really know each other. So um, we created a group, first of all, and we tried to share among us and find out what we could do. And uh, uh, we repeatedly asked for the university to allocate an office, not to create more straight jackets in administrative terms, but in order to coordinate all of us that are in different fields trying to do things. So if I am at the Faculty of the Humanities, I may be doing more what Joe was saying, trying to you know, offer certain classes or create venues for cultural exchange language, but then there may be others in the uh, lawyers or psychologists or pedagogists who may be keen, you know, to intervene in the process in other ways. So the university can do a lot in order to systematize without, uh, with this implying that the administration then dictates such rule that instead of helping becomes a setback. This is like, that's why I'm saying the dance on the threshold. It's like we want to see the good practices becoming a systematized practice. On the other side, I think flexibility, it's a must because not everyone, you know, everyone is different. And so if you're talking about unidiversity in, in this case, you know, we need to remember that flexibility is crucial for the sustainability of any kind of project. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. And we do have two well, rather comments in our chat. So audience is a bit shy with asking questions today, but very useful comments on other projects, best practices. Um, so I will actually, I think I will ask, ask a last question around uh, something we have talked about a lot of which came up again and again, it's the topic of co-creation. So on how to involve refugees, migrants in the development of services and structures and policies, ideas, etc. So I think I would like to address this question uh, to all of you, starting with Juan. Uh, can you share any experience, uh, any best practices on how to involve maybe uh, migrants or other groups in the development of your projects, especially with Erasmus students. I mean, there might be students among them who have own experience as refugees and migrants, actually, so especially among students, but also maybe about researchers. And if you have, don't have any experience, are you planning to maybe involve migrants and refugees in the further development of your activities? Yes, thank you very much. I think we have some different layers here, right? Because when we, in our case, we have two contexts when we talk about migrants and refugees. We have first migrants and refugees as part of the international student community. So for instance, this is a case that happens quite often in ESN in which uh, students, you know, like come for an, for an exchange or, or come to study abroad, but then decide to stay. Some cases for for political problems. We have some cases in our membership of, of students who become, who apply for international protection after their Erasmus mobility, or simply that, you know, they don't want to go back to our countries and they become, let's say, they, they want to become either economic migrants, sometimes humanitarian mi migrants, but then they are, let's say, ingrained in our student community, sometimes as volunteers, sometimes as students who kind of receive the support from our from our ES and local associations. And then co-creation processes happen within the normal framework of consultation that we do basically using through main channels. First one is data. So we, we all, in ESN, we're highly data-driven. That means that we, through both internal, meaning for all volunteers, and external, meaning for students, we collect data that then inspires our activities and we define priorities depending on data, but then is the more quality and structure part, which is that, as I said, we are fully grassroots based. That means that everything we do starts with dialogue at the local level in which those priorities are identified. Of course, the most prominent case in the last few years, it's clearly Ukraine, right? In which we have ESN Ukraine, ESN Ukraine 
uh, with the start of the invasion becomes one of the actors in the necessary measures uh, that the students had to, you know, like the students needed to, while they were abroad, they conduct a survey of Ukrainian students abroad. And we are part of that process as he is an international, helping to collect the data, to analyze the data, to think about the policy takeaways. Thanks to their feedback, we work from a policy perspective to try to adapt the Erasmus program so it can better support Ukrainian students. So once again, we have this process in which the voice of our students combined with data helps us to identify policy measures that are needed to support a target group. But that happens within our normal framework. And then what you also have is the, let's say, the community engagement side in which all ES and local associations also work with local actors. Let's say, for instance, uh, refugee associations in different, in different cities across Europe. And then it's also our normal process when we work with external stakeholders, mainly with NGOs and schools. And it's basically a process of thinking about their needs and priorities, explaining how we can help. So what are the strengths that we have? We are good at organizing events. We are good at communication. We are good at mobilization of students and then see how we can, we can plan those initiatives. I think that in both cases, uh, what is really important for us is the combination of data with qualitative information through structured consultation and a structured dialogue. Um, because we, we feel that otherwise it's really easy to kind of, you know, if you don't collect data in a structured way, it is also really easy to kind of manipulate a bit more the information that you get, especially in a large scale organization like ESN. And also to have clear process to move from bottom to top and also to, you know, like bottom up, but also top down sometimes when you identify a certain, a certain new need based on also the needs that your members have, have expressed. So this is a bit what we how what we are doing, what we would like to do, and this is your plan for the next few years. Because in the in the last few years, we have seen an increase. This is I feel like applicable to all the sector, an increase in the number of, of students that come and then seek international protection. We have more and more members who are refugees. I think you're all following the discussions around students at risk initiatives, etc. Right. But in the particular case of Erasmus+, Plus, as Erasmus becomes more global, we want to improve more our capacity to identify the exact needs of those students already when they arrive, right? They arrive, they need to undergo certain processes that are very particular when you go on Erasmus and then you want to apply for international protection. And we would like to build our capacity more to understand how even at the national and international level, we can support our local associations who are the ones on the ground to, to, be a, you know, to have a more prominent role in those processes of, of supporting uh, migrants and refugees from a legal perspective, because in, already from a more day-to-day peer-to-peer perspective, it's already happening. Because in the end, and this is the interesting thing, in, and with this I finalize, um, many of the needs expressed by migrants and refugees and students from our experience are just very similar to, to the needs of international students who might be coming only for the degree or for an exchange. They need that kind of intercultural support. They need practical support with aspects like housing, et cetera. So many of the things are, are quite applicable. We just need to build the expertise on the different things, which is the legal framework and you know the, the kind of specific support measures based on your background. So I hope that this gives a general picture of, of how we carry out those processes. Thanks, Juan. And I was just reminded that we totally run out of time. So I hope nobody is offended if we we finish here, but we won't finish just finishing. We will uh, see the trailer in the end of our session, which Mara mentioned. So I'm really looking forward to it. But uh, before doing so, I would like to thank all panelists for being here, the organizers again, Laura and Pete for helping us with our organizational background of this webinar. I hope uh, the audience enjoyed the webinar. Uh, if you are interested in our activities, please check out the Unica and the City Working Group website. You're very welcome to join the activities. And we are also looking forward to your uh, evaluation reports, which will be the basis for the decision if we continue with this webinar series or we don't. But uh, that's it so far from, from my side. So thanks to everyone for being here. Laura and Pete, I don't know if you want to say something, but uh, if not, we would like to see the trailer of the movie. So thanks again. Thank thanks you, guys. Just shortly, thank you all very much for your attention. And thank you also to speakers, Tobias, Joe, 
Juan, Mara, and Michelle for your contribution and support. I'll be sharing the video right now. من در سال 2000 به دنیا آمدیم و در سالهای اول زندگیم زندگیم به کلن حادثات اتفاق افتاد که کلن زندگیم تغییر کرد دو تیاره آمدن و تو این تاورز نیویارک را از بین بردن و دفتن آجل امریکا ها آمدن به کشور ما و شروع به جنگ با طالبان کردن я відчув себе зрадником. Я хотіла залишитися. І якби потребувало б, я навіть боролася за свою країну. Але я розумію, що краще мені залишитися тут зараз. Я б з задоволенням повернулася додому, до своєї кімнати, до нормального життя. Згадки до війни не завжди залишаються для мене моїм безпечним місцем, де я можу сховатися в важкі години. You are here because you are interested in following your studies at the university and we are we have this transition course to the university that aims to provide the students of Spanish and Catalan knowledge because these are the, the languages that we are. Перший день в Іспанії був неймовірно для мене складним. Я хотіла повернутися додому. Я хотіла бути вдома. Я хотіла, щоб все повернулося назад. Я не могла витримати цього тиску своїх думок, які я мала. І постійно це відчуття, неначе твоє горло стискається. Ти не хочеш їсти, ти не хочеш спати. زندگی لفظ زیباست و شنیدن مگر عمرست در درد و رنج سیستن مشکلات مانند پروانه در چار درد را فت پرواز کنند واحی یکی را در دست گیری دیگر از دست روند That was powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations, Mara. Oh. I was just like part of a team, the team. <laughs> but thank you for sharing it. Oh, and thanks again, everyone. So see you next time. Thanks and again. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. You, bye-bye. <laughs>